Okay, so for our class study today, we are going to be looking at a poem that's called Our Other Sister. It is written by Jeffrey Harrison. If you notice here in our assignment, which is located inside of the module, so this is module one, back to school, um, section three, which is class study. So every class study assignment will be a whatever the module is, so like 2.3, 4.3, whatever. So 1.3.2, class study assignment, Our Other Sister. We're going to read through this poem once, and then we're going to read it again and mark language. So I probably should have written, read the following poem twice through. The second time you read, mark language that is vivid. So the first time we're just going to read it together to see what it's about, get a sense of it. If you want to click on this link right here, it will take you to a Google Doc. When it opens, it will be a view only. You can make a copy in your own drive to edit it and write on it. So you can do that. I also will have paper copies in class if you would prefer to do that. If you are at home, you're welcome to print it out and handwrite it and then submit the JPEG file in the submit assignment uh, tab right here that you'll click on. So um, we're going to read through it. Then we're going to mark language that is vivid. And we're essentially looking for the answers to like, how does the narrator develop his story in such a short, short space? So if you're wondering what, what language is vivid, this is a good way to do it. Okay. Our Other Sister for Ellen by Jeffrey Harrison. The cruelest thing I did to my younger sister wasn't shooting a homemade blow dart into her knee where it dangled for a breathless second before dropping off but telling her we had another, older sister who'd gone away. What my motives were, I can't recall. A whim? Or was it some need of mine to toy with loss to probe the ache of imaginary wounds? But that first sentence was like a strand of DNA that replicated itself in coiling lies when my, older sis when my sister began asking her desperate questions. I called our sis older sister Isabel and gave her hazel eyes and long blonde hair. I had her run away to California, where she took drugs and made hippie jewelry. Before I knew it, she'd moved to Santa Fe and opened a shop. She sent a postcard every year or so, but she'd stopped calling. I can still see my younger sister staring at me, her eyes widening with desolation, then filling with tears. I can still remember how thrilled and horrified I was that something I'd just made up had that kind of power. And I could still feel the blow dart of remorse stabbing me in the heart as I rushed to tell her none of it was true, but it was too late. Our other sister had already taken shape, and we could not call her back from her life far away or tell her how badly we missed her. Okay, so that was the first read through. So the second read through is probably just going to be reading silently in your head. Um, now that we've read through it once, you can kind of, you already know what's going on a little bit. You can go back through and take note of those moments that caught your attention. Mark language that is vivid. What created an image for you in your head, right? We're, and we're looking to answer the question, how does the narrator develop his story in such a short space? So in this poem, he's managed to tell this story about this mean thing that he did to his sister, right? Now, if I look at this first, for example, if I were doing this, um, if I look at this very first stanza or paragraph in poetry terms, right? This first stanza, something that stands out to me is this homemade blow dart. That it, and shoot, he shoots it into his sister's knee and it dangles there. That is pretty vivid. So I'm going to highlight that. Then the next thing that catches my attention is actually the strand of DNA. I'm, I'm going to catch it from like a strand of DNA because 
that caught my attention and then also replicated itself in coiling lies. So I can just imagine a DNA strand, what it looks like, how it has that double helix that wraps around itself and everything's intertwined. I start getting this image. Um, and then he describes his this fake older sister. She has hazel eyes and long blonde hair. So that's pretty vivid. That gives you a, an image. Um, hippie jewelry also gives me an image. Like, okay, yeah, I can imagine this person, whoever she is. Um, the next image for me is actually with his younger sister in this fourth stanza. One, two, three, four, five, six, six seventh stanza, sorry. Um, her eyes widening with desolation, then filling with tears. I can just see that in my head, right? Like someone's eyes getting wide and then getting teary eyed. Um, and then we've got this image again. The blow dart comes back, but this time it's stabbing him in the heart. And it's not her, it's him, right? Um, so that's pretty, that's pretty vivid. Those are my vivid moments. Now that we've done the first part, mark language that is vivid, that gives us imagery, we're going to move on to the next question, which is, how does the narrator develop his story in such a short space? In this, I'm going to insert a text box, but how you do a text box is you have to insert a drawing, and then you hit new, and then it lets you do a text box. In Microsoft Word, it's a little different. So I'm going to insert a text box here, and I want to copy my question in here from my assignment. How does the narrator develop his story in such a short space? I'm going to copy that, control C if you're using shortcut keys, and I'm going to paste it into here, control V if you're using shortcut keys. Um, the reason I copied the question over is so that I remember what it is and then I can answer it. So what I'm going to do right now is just hit save and close <laughs> so I can format this so it's next to my poem. If I were writing this on a, a piece of paper I would just be write, answering this question in the space next to the poem that I already have. Um, because it's in Google Docs I'm just going to Formatted so it's wrapped text, which is what this middle button does, and then that allows me to move this text box around, which I'm going to move next to the poem on this side. And then, as you can see, there's a little edit button right here, which lets me go back in and type further. So I just sometimes like to look at my question and then look back at my original source. It's always nice to be able to do both of those things. If I'm too far away from the text for a while I forget what I wanted to say so that's why I'm doing it this way the thing that I'm noticing here is he develops his story by comparison and this is not the only way he develops his story but this is one of the ways um, so what he's doing in this first stanza right he's saying the cruelest thing I did to my younger sister wasn't which tells us, like, maybe you would think that the meanest thing I've ever done is shoot her in the knee with this homemade blood art, but it wasn't. That wasn't the meanest thing I did to her. And then the second stanza, we've got the but that comes up, which indicates this is the thing that he thinks is worse, telling her we had another older sister who'd gone away. Now, if you have siblings, he's kind of building off of this relationship, right, that siblings have with each other where... You love each other, but maybe you kind of drive each other crazy and you are mean to each other. And so that's a common sibling um, relationship that gets utilized in this poem to help set the stage. Like this wouldn't work so well if it was two friends because um, a friend wouldn't be like as, as easy to convince that you have a, a, an older sister who ran away from home. But a younger sibling, definitely. So he's making this comparison that is between something physical and something emotional. So those are some of the things that we've noticed that he's doing. 
And I'm going to just type that up in here. If it will let me. <laughs> Come on. There we go. The narrator builds the story or develops his story. Builds, develops, similar <laughs> concept. Develops his story by comparison. He compares a physical, I can type, <laughs> mean thing he did to his sister to an emotional mean thing he did his, to his sister. He also uses a common experience, aka sibling uh, um, relationships to draw the reader in and um, and then obviously we have the vivid, vivid imagery which we could also refer back to. He builds on this through his vivid imagery, which turns his blow dart into a symbol. Right? So that's, that's some ways that he does that. I'm going to save and close. The last thing we look back, we want to consider this question. So this is going to be a question we return to all the time in this first quarter of the year and probably even throughout the year is how can just a story be dangerous right he told his sister that just a story it wasn't a big deal or anything in at first <laughs> in his mind but then um it grows into something right uh this this sentence right here which covers this whole stanza of well, these is included in these three stanzas. I can still remember how thrilled and horrified I was that something I just made up had that kind of power. And I can still feel the blow dart of remorse stabbing me in the heart as I rushed to tell her none of it was true. So for this one, because it's the, que the question, kind of our essential question, if you looked at our board, um, that we're going to return to over and over again, I'm just going to make a little line, which, that just helps me know I'm done looking at this poem. Now I'm just going to share my thoughts about it. If you want to copy the question, control C, paste, control V, that would be helpful as well. Um, and here, here, I'm going to just work on my, my answer. It might be something as simple as in this poem, just a story. was so traumatic it made the narrator's sister cry. Sometimes stories can be dangerous because they have an emotional impact on people, even without being true right people people can believe lies just as easily as the truth and maybe even more so than the truth and I don't, maybe more so is a bad choice there oh well I thought more so was one word I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I want to add. Ah, I like the coiling lies line, right? Like the DNA. The DNA, right? One line in the poem states that lies are like DNA, which shows how easily 
facts and fiction can be twisted. And those are my thoughts. So when you're done with something like this, then I want you to submit it to your assignment in here. You'll just click Submit. And then you should be able to click Google Drive and import it, right? Select File and import it. If you have any questions or if you have any issues submitting your work, please let me know. Um, hopefully this video helped.